Welcome to the Circuit Rider Bible Study with Andy Brink. Proverbs chapter 6. Let's pray once you get there. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, um, I just want to give thanks. I just, um, what I just feel just for myself, it's such liberty. Lord, just coming in here today and, and um, so grateful for the praise and worship. And um, Lord, I just know my, my heart is just excited about you. And I just want to thank you, Lord. Um, thank you for the word that you shared. And Lord, I just pray for this particular part that um, I just confess. I don't even know how to begin or how to continue on in this. But Lord, I, I just... Um, I'm poor in spirit and I need your guidance and wisdom. I thank you that your Holy Spirit is here to guide us and lead us and to open up truth to us and, and to convict us of our hearts and our hearts of, of what is there and to lead us into a place of repentance and healing and restoration. And so, Lord, we come to you and, and our eyes are upon you, Lord, as a servant looks to the hand of their master and as a Mistress to the hand of her maiden, or maiden to the hand of her mistress, Lord, so our eyes look upon you until you will be merciful and gracious to us. And so that's where we come this morning. Our eyes are upon you, that you would be merciful and gracious, and that you would open yourself up to us, and that we would leave here with our minds and our thoughts on you. Lord, we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Joyce had asked me yesterday if I had something, and I just mentioned to her there's a couple of things I was working on, but I didn't know if I had anything in particular. And, and so last night um, I wrote down this scripture, and and I had something I'd been meditating on all week, but uh, it just started going a whole different direction on really going towards things God was dealing with in my heart. I mean, I was thinking about some other things, but there was also a place I was walking, and God was... God was working some things out in my heart, and and then the scriptures just began to come, and I began to write these down. So um, I'm going to start in Proverbs chapter six, verse. Um, just want to read. Let me just start in verse twenty. My son, keep thou my, keep thy father's commandments, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually about thine heart, and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is a light. And reproofs for instruction are the way to li- are the way of life. And um, I just want to begin with that scripture because reproofs for instruction are the way of life. And um, he promises us that his word will speak to us. In the morning, it'll walk with us in the way. It'll talk with us. The Holy Spirit is there to 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 cause us and to conform us into the image of Christ. And as we continue to put our eyes upon Him, just like I know in my walk, um, just lately, His Word, God brought me into a place where the where the Phineas spirit looked into my heart and, and told me exactly what was happening. It was a divided heart, and I'll get into that more later. But um. As, as that was set and setting in there, His Word began to confirm that. His Word began to talk to me. His commandment was a lamp. His law was a light. And it gave me direction. It let me see my heart as God saw it. And then it gave me hope and it said, Turn to me, that times of refreshing will come. So His Word is a lamp. It's a light. If we have a teachable heart. And that's a whole other series of scriptures I've been looking at, but it says the, the, the scornful, they, they, they turn from reproof. They do not want correction. They say, tell us no more about the Holy One of Israel. Tell us good things that'll, that, that'll, that'll make us feel good while all the while destruction is working in them. But it says the law is a lamp and His commandments is, is, is a light. And it shows us our heart for the purpose of turning us toward that which is good so that He can pour out his blessing, what is true blessing upon our life. He loves us. He wants to show us the way to walk in. Um, look with me in Psalms 19. Psalms 
I got a little carried away last night, so God will have to show me which scriptures to, to read and which scriptures to go past. Psalms 19, verse um, 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them my servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. And it says his commandment, his statutes, his testimony, the fear of the Lord, these things are right. And it says more desirable are they to be to you and I than gold. More desirable are his, is Jesus and His Word to be to us than, than any material thing, any possession, anything that we have. And I will tell you, when He begins to enlighten our heart, you know, there is nothing, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, there is nothing when the Word begins to, to leap off the pages to you that can compare. You know, there, there is nothing... When God, when the living rain, and when Jesus, the living Word, begins to open Himself up to you, there, there, there is is nothing to compare. But I'm going to show you, I think, through the Word, one of the, the snares and entrapments that wasn't spoken to the pagan world. It was spoken to the church because in Timothy it says this particular snare can pierce you through. It can cause your faith to become shipwrecked. It can stop you. And I can see in my own walk how this particular snare several different times has tried to come up and stop me in my walk with God. But it's been God's mercy. And as He's worked through people to give correction and instruction, as He's worked just through His Word and His Holy Spirit to open my eyes to, the, to this snare that I was almost entrapped by, I'll tell you, I come with a thankful heart. But I'm telling you, He's speaking this Word to Christians just like in Mark chapter 4. When he talks about the, the parable of the sower and the seed, one of the one of the, the snares, the entrapments against the word of God being performed in our life are the worries of the world, the lusts and desires for other things, and the cares of this world that come in and choke the word so that it becomes unfruitful, so that it doesn't bear fruit in our life. Look with me in um, Haggai chapter one. Right between Zephaniah and Zechariah. I'm there all the time, but I still can't find it. Haggai chapter 1, um, starting in verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shaltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. And you know, I believe what was happening here, if I'm correct, these were people in captivity. These were people that had been taken captive. And in that place of captivity, they had begun to build their lives. And they had begun to be comfortable. And all of a sudden, God rose up a prophet, Haggai, to come to them. And what he exposed them, he said, Listen, y'all are saying that the time for the house of the Lord is not, is not now to be rebuilt. And we're going to look at the reasons they were saying that. But I believe, like Joyce shared, I believe that we're coming into uh, a time of um, absolute excitement about what God wants to do. Not just in this place, but in His body. All over. He wants to express Himself. He wants to open Himself up. He wants to come that He might bind up the brokenhearted, that He might heal those that that, that are wounded, that He might um, open up blind eyes, that He might preach the gospel to the poor. He's coming, and He wants to do this work. He He is going to have a body. And it says in Isaiah that that body will be like a burning torch, like a flame of righteousness. And it says that His watchmen will not keep silent until that comes about. 
So this is the church that he's speaking about. But right here we see a people that have become comfortable, they become complacent, and their cry is, listen, it's not time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt because of verse 3. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed or paneled houses, and this house lie waste? I'm going to read down um, through verse 11. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, but bring in little. You eat, but there is not enough. You drink, but there is not enough to fill to be filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but there is none warm. And ye that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it. And I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow it up. I did blow it. I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is waste, and ye run every man to his own house. Therefore the heavens over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of your hands. So he says, everything that you bring in, I blow away. And it's as you have money to put into a purse with holes, it just continues to go. And I can tell you, as I've looked back on my walk in my life, not too long ago, um, I remember there was a season time where, where I had nothing. And I really did, I began to pray, you know, Lord, I just, I just want to be able to give. I mean, I really, that was in my heart. I just want to have something even to, to offer to other people or to, you know, my heart was wanting to give. And, and so there came a, a situation where I, I got to get involved in a, in a, in a business opportunity. And, and all of a sudden I began to make. And I found that the more I began to make, the more I began to spend. And the more I continued to make, my lifestyle began to depend upon a lot more other things. And I would try and give token gifts here and there, but really my heart was being exposed because greed was beginning to take over. And you know what? I never could get enough. At first I had nothing, and you would think anything would be a blessing. But then what I had was never enough. Because I was spending it on myself. And I want to get beyond, I'm going to get beyond money as we go further on because the issue has nothing to do with money. It has to do with a divided heart. It has to do with a heart that's in adultery. That, that is bent towards the lusts of this world and not truly in love with Him. A divided heart. And that's what God showed me this week in my own life. And I'll get, get on to that example. Look with me and... Um, Isaiah 55. And we're going to end up coming back to Haggai later on. But it's amazing when the people repented, God began to stir the hearts of the people to do His will and His work done His way. And great joy began to, to, to come forth. Isaiah 55, verse 1, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye and buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight in fatness. He says, come to me. I want you to eat of that which has to do with eternal life. I want to give you an eternal perspective. I want you to feed on that which is bread and deed. And I've known all kinds of people, and again I include myself in that, that, that we look to everything else to satisfy you know, I remember, you know, I looked to, to vacations and trips to satisfy me. I would, I would look ahead to the one part of the summer every year when I could get to Colorado. And I could go hiking and climbing. Adventure. You know, uh, I looked to all kinds of things to satisfy me. You know, um, there was a season in time when I looked toward working out 
to satisfy me. It was more than just keeping in shape. It was something I had to do to satisfy something within me. And it began to, that's where I began to spend my time. You know, I don't know what it might be for each person here. What is it that satisfies you? He says, why do you spend your life? Why do you spend your money on that which does not satisfy, that has no eternal purpose or well-being? I'm going to tell you, we, when we get honest with ourselves and get honest with God, we do. And, there, and I know that there's a balance. And you know, there's times when I come home, I remember last time I could have bought Rebecca a $2 rose, but I, bought, I went to a florist. I bought a nice thing of flowers. And I don't see anything wrong with that. But I'm going to tell you, when we begin to look at our life and really judge, what are we spending ourselves for? We'll find the things that are important to us. There was a season and time in my life as a, as a new a believer. I say new. I mean, I'd been walking with the Lord for a while, but I'd moved to Houston. And uh, God was just taking me through another furnace of affliction to show me my heart. And I had spent the night with some friends home at, some, at a friend's home, and I came home early in the morning because I had to get dressed for work and, and take off. And I got to my house, and I could tell it had been broken into. And it was like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning when I got there, and so I was just kind of pressing through and, and looking through all the rooms real, you know, carefully and turning on the lights. And the thing I was noticing is that nothing had been taken. And I could tell someone had been there. So I slowly, you know, and kind of fearfully went up into the upstairs where my bed was and everything, and I was looking around, and I turned the lights on in my room, and you know what? All my drawers were open, and everything was just torn apart, and I thought, started thinking, hmm. But I looked, and there was still my radio, and there was still this. I looked at all the things that would seem important. You know what was stolen? Somebody had found my suitcase in there or whatever, and they just packed the suitcase with all my clothes. But if you would have seen my clothes, I had nice suits and ties. I had, you know, my whole wardrobe was polos and this and this and that. And, and God knew that there was something in my heart there. But God had set that up to expose something in my heart and life. What do you spend your life on that doesn't satisfy and I believe in the days that we're coming in, God wants to bring us to a place. And I don't mean coming into a place of legalistic and, and law where you can, you know, only buy, you know, whatever. You know, God will lead us and guide us. But I'm going to tell you where, where we begin to spend our life on those things that are important, on those things that have eternal value, on the hearts and lives of people, on, on the things that minister to those hearts and lives. And, and um, we'll get further on in just a moment. Look with me in Isaiah 65. Verse 10. And Sharon shall be a fold of flocks in the valley of Achor, a place for herds to lie down in, for my people that have sought me. But ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for troop, or in the numeric standard it says fortune, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number, which in the numeric standard says destiny. So you prepare a table for fortune and for destiny. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, and did evil, but mine before mine eyes and did choose that wherein I did not delight. And you know, it says in the New Testament, Jesus says, the things that this world esteems are detestable before God. And right here in the Scripture it says, these are the people that forsake the Lord because they set a table for fortune. And they, 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 they pull out an offering for destiny. I'm going to tell you how many times in our own life has God begun to come to our life and try and give us direction or try and give us some wisdom in some way. But our mindset is, well, I can't do that because, you know, I can't provide for myself doing that or I can't step out in this direction or I can't be a part of this because our mindset is monetary. If I do this and walk away from this, and it's amazing how much of our life is spent dictating what we can and can't do by 
our present job, or what we have, or what we don't have, rather than obedience to what God is saying. And I'm not, you know, saying everybody leave your job and stuff like that. You know, if I was, matter of fact, um, well, I was contemplating, you know, just getting a, a part-time job just lately. You know, and if God told me not to share another word and to go to work and, and work with my hands and do whatever it is, I can tell you with all honesty, that is fine with me. I mean, I enjoy teaching and stuff. I'm not saying that, but, but it doesn't bother me going to work. So that's not what I'm saying. Everybody quit your jobs. But what I am saying is be obedient to the voice of God. And God will put us in a place where we have to depend upon Him. You'll never know God is your provider until He puts you in a place where you need Him to provide. You know, and God has to put us in that place. And I can go through all kinds of stories where, you know, when I was working in Houston, and for a young man I was making pretty good money, and God caused me to move to, to Corpus Christi with another family that really didn't have a whole lot. But, you know, it didn't bother me at the time because I had saved up enough where I was to um, get me through a while. Well, once I got down there, he kept me there for a year and a half until I had expended everything I had. And then I can remember it was like just pouring, just distress and, 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 and confusion and all kinds of stuff began to come into my life. I remember, what do I do? What do I do? And I went everywhere filling out applications and, and run into this place and run into that place. And, and finally I sat down in just distress. And I opened my Bible and God spoke this word to me. And I've never forgot it because of that fire that I was in. And He said, Have you not considered the birds of the air? Or how about the lilies of the field? How they neither toil or, or turn, but God clothes them. He feeds the birds. Will He not much more take care of you of little fame? And for some, and that was Rhema. That was living, living manna to me. And I stopped for a moment and I just repented. God, I don't know what to do, but I know that You've got me in this place. And it was amazing. You know, one, one particular thing that happened, just to, to testify about God's goodness, is I had nothing. And it was coming up on Christmas, and I had um, a full tank of gas and ended up taking somebody to Houston that needed to get there. And I was on my way back to Corpus Christi, and I remember thinking, God, I don't have any way to get back to Houston to visit my family for Christmas. I don't have anything. But Lord, if you want me back, you'll make a way. And it was one of those things you hear people talk about, you know, big preachers and stuff like that. And I got home, and, and somebody, and the person inside walked out with an envelope that had come in the mail. And in that envelope was simply $20. And I was so excited. I knew that $20 was to get me back to Houston. God had heard my prayer. Well, that very same afternoon, somebody had come into the food pantry of the mission, and we were so broken to this church that was supporting us had stopped, and we had nothing. So here this person is that had nothing, came in to get something that we had nothing of. And they said, um, we need something. They had a family. So this whole group of us got back in the very back and we're trying, we had nothing. And so we're talking and find a, the main person said, uh, all right, does anybody have any money? We can run down to the grocery store and get them something. And I knew I had $20. But I wouldn't say anything because God had given me this $20 <laughs> to get back to Florida, I mean to Houston. And um, we were sitting there and we were sitting there and, and all of a sudden I said, I've got some money. You know, I can... I can go. So I went to the grocery store and I spent a little over ten dollars getting everything, you know, beans and you know, rice and things like that, and got back and we gave it to them. And I was thinking, I don't know how I'm going to get to Houston on nine dollars because I had a big gas guzzler and it took over twenty dollars to fill it up. And I remember I got to the gas station and I, I put it in and it was on empty. And I put it in and all of a sudden it stopped. And I looked at the thing and it said nine dollars and like thirty five cents and I, I kept hitting it because I knew it couldn't be full. And finally it was at nine dollars and forty cents and I figured it's full. And I mean I was doing backflips, I was excited again. The next day I'm headed to Houston and by the time I got to Houston the demons had talked me out of it and saying, Well that thing probably your your um, gas gauge was probably broken or something like that. And it was 
less expensive in Houston to fill up the gas tank. And I remember once I got there, you know, my dad had given me some money and I went to fill it up. And it was like $24 to fill it up. I had filled up my gas tank on $9.40 while in Houston, while in Corpus Christi. But I'm going to tell you, I would never know that if I had not trusted Him and stepped out there. And I don't mean stepping out again just for the sake of stepping out. I'm just going to do this. Because you'll be cursed. But when you step out because of something God has spoken to your heart, I'm going to tell you, and Rebecca can vouch for this, we, 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 God has continued to send different things in our life, and, and it's like the, the provisions will come, and then all of a sudden all these bills will come out of nowhere. And I remember we had this one that came out that we weren't even expecting, and I remember I was looking and I said, the issue is not the money. The issue is our heart. Send it off. And you know what? More and more we're realizing in our life that the issue is not finances. The issue is God because He is in control. So Lord, we put our eyes upon You. And everywhere I've been throughout until this point in my life, everything, even hearing other Christians and believers talk, you know, I'll be sitting and talking, it's all has to do with, with money. Well, I wish I could do that, but this dictates what I do and don't do. What dictates what we do and don't do is the voice of God. And if God says go, then you go knowing that He will make a way. And if God says stay, then you stay. And we'll get into that that part in just a little bit. But they were cursed because they made a table for fortune and destiny. Look with me in Ezekiel chapter 16. And again, we're speaking about the snare of greed snare of covetousness. And um, if you read in Revelation 3, we'll go there right now, but it says the church of Laodicea. You know, and we forget the fact that the church of Laodicea at one point, I'm sure, was a church, a living church with a life in it. But something had happened to them. They had begun to increase, and I believe believe like the children of Israel and Haggai, they begun to take their increase and spend it on themselves. To spend it on their life. And one of the things they say in the church of Laodicea, you know, I am rich and increased with goods. And I've hidden even nothing. In Deuteronomy, over and over again, he spoke to the children of Israel. He says, when you become increased with goods, when I take you into the good land, God wanted to bless them. He wanted to open himself out. He wanted to pour himself out. But he said, when you become increased with goods, your heart will turn away from me. Your heart will begin to turn away from me. And then when I begin to to touch the things that you trust in, you'll begin to turn your heart back to me. But over and over again, there was this warning. How many of us can look in our life and see that when God began to increase our life with goods or with things we begun to take them things to ourselves and spend them on ourselves. And we began to forget the consideration of the work of God that He was doing and is doing. I'll tell you what, there are servants of the Lord that are out there right now just trusting God because God's put them out there. And His people are continuing to spend their money on their own life, on their own pursuits, on their own things that will satisfy them. I'm going to tell you, there will be a day where each one of us will stand before the courts of heaven. Not only will we give an account for the things, the idle words we speak, or the things we look upon, the hidden things of our heart, we will give an account for the way we've spent the resources God has given us. You and I, we will stand before the living God. You know what? A lot of people have taken what they've had to, 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 um, to cause themselves to survive in the days ahead. Now, now there are those that God has put to to store things and to set things aside for difficult times. But I'm going to tell you, if you're storing and setting aside for your own survival, I believe you've missed God. The purpose for our storing and setting aside is not only for our own survival, but for the survival of the body. To give as He's showed us, as He's given us wisdom, the purpose for our storing is to help. I remember there was an, there's an elderly man who I wish could come here to Palestine sometime. Um, he's a man that's walked with God all, I, mean, most, I mean, many, many years. 
I remember one time I was sitting with him and, and listening to what he was saying, and, and I had to leave. And I said, Mr. Liss, can you share with me one thing? Can you just give me one thing that I can walk away from here and just embrace and meditate on and think on? And you know what? He did not even take a moment to think. And this is a person that when he reads the Word, tears come down his eyes. His wife has to make him go to bed at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning because he needs his sleep and can't get away from the Word. And without even thinking, he said, freely you've received, freely give. And he said, this has to do with everything in your life. I'm going to tell you, during those times and places where I wish I had monetary things or things to give people, God would come to me and I wouldn't have anything. He'd say, give of yourself. There's a lady, matter of fact, I could go on and on, but um, I can think of two people off the top of my head that my life is indebted to. But it wasn't because of the money they gave. It was because of a life poured out. One of which was in Florida, and and this person had nothing really financially to give to me throughout my life. And they've even written me letters now saying, I wish I could send you a little something. But you know what? Throughout my life, what they would do when I was in school, they'd just cut up fruit for me. I'd come over before school. And they just put in videotapes for me to watch testimonies and the word. They were discipling me in many different ways. What they did have to give, they did. And that was a kitchen table and a place to sit and talk and say, I love you. Their life was not consistent just in their own family. I could call them today and they loved me like their own child. And one of the others is, is Joyce and Milton. You know, they gave of their life and still are. And the reason God has continued to bless them is because they've not been a a, a channeled up well or a a blocked up well. They've continued to give of everything that they have. Their home, it's an open place for people to come. You know, how many of us every single day come in and out of their home, her home? Is your home open like that? Is it a place where people come in and out of? If you don't have, finances to give? Are you giving of your life? Are you opening up your life for the broken or for the brethren or for people to come and feed on the life of God within you? You know, money is just one portion of giving. Look with Ezekiel 16, it says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. And we think of Sodom and Gomorrah, we think of homosexuality. and um, Yeah, Isaiah 16, verse 49. But this was the sin and the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She had pride in her heart, the fullness of bread. Oops. Yeah, Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, the fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy, And they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. Their sin was that they had fullness of bread. They had idleness and they did not consider the poor. I'm going to tell you, this whole Bible study really began. I began looking at um, Jesus when he stood in the synagogue and he said, um, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the gospel to the poor. And then I noticed, and here's something God just began to speak in my heart, was that um, then He says to, to bind up the brokenhearted, to open up blind eyes. I really believe this, and I just have to study it more, but um, we're not going to see the rest of it come until there's the people who are poor of spirit. The healing comes at the place of brokenness. The healing comes, you'll notice all through the Scriptures, that when the people came to that place, and that word poor means beggary. When they came to the place where they cast themselves down upon Jesus and cried out and nothing would stop their cry until God had met with them, God began to heal them and open up blind eyes and do that work. And I really, I pray, God, bring me to the place of poverty of spirit where my dependence is solely upon you day after day after day. And I know that you are enough. Look with me in Luke chapter 4. He 
You know, Jesus was tested in the same way as you and I are. And we're about to look at the testing of the disciple in just a moment. But um, Luke chapter 4 and... and um, Okay, Luke chapter 4, but it says, and um, he goes down through the different temptations, and I'm going to start in verse 5, and the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and in a moment of time the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. If thou for will worship me, and shall be thine, it shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou worship. And Jesus said, He said, You and I will serve one of two masters. You cannot walk with both of them. You cannot serve money and be a disciple of the Lord. Money cannot be your master. And master means they're the ones that dictate your life, what you do. And He says, You cannot serve God and mammon. You'll either hate the one and cling to the other or hold to the one and despise the other. One of the two. But you have to make that choice. And right here, Jesus was tempted in the same way, just as you and I are tempted. And it wasn't just in this play, but He was shown all the kingdoms of the world, all its beauty. And like we said earlier, all the fool's gold that was set before Him. And in the midst of that test, and He was a man like you and I. He was God come in the man of the flesh and was tested. And he suffered in the flesh. And I'm sure that that was a place of suffering for him. And I'm sure the temptations were coming to his mind and and showing him the beauty of all that is. But he chose in his heart and he said, I've come to worship only the Lord God. He is the one that will dictate my life and the direction of it and what I am and His will. Not all these things. And it says in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, all these died in faith without receiving the promises because they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims. I want to ask you, are you a stranger and a pilgrim in this life? Or have you, like the place of Haggai, have you done like they did and become satisfied with this life? Become comfortable with what this life has to offer? Look with me in um, Matthew chapter 6. And as we um, look at the scripture, you know, and I just tell you, just because of the fires and testings and trials in my life, um, more and more so, there have been things that have happened this week with other people, or not this week, in the last month or so, I remember just coming back to my own place and the, and the thoughts of my own mind and the contemplation of my heart was, you know, Lord, is there anything that, that I could get rid of in order to meet that need? I mean, it's just beginning to happen in my heart. It really is. And, and God also comes in wisdom and He says, you know, I've got that happening for a reason. You know, don't jump in and... and, 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 and take away from what I'm trying to do. So there's, I'm not saying we just give to everything that we see. I'm going to tell you, it's beginning in my heart. Lord, do I have something I can sell or get rid of in order to meet a need that I see in the body? You know what? That's what happened in the book of Acts. Their heart was not tied to this world. They were pilgrims on a journey. They were passing through. And they began to give of everything they had and sell it for the purpose of meeting true and real needs that were there in the body. And again, it was under the direction and wisdom of the Spirit. And they began to, even when they didn't know, they would give it to to those within the body. And they'd say, meet these needs. Because they didn't want credit for it. They didn't want to be lifted up. They were simply obeying God and wanted to exalt Him. Wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's where we'll look in Matthew chapter 6. Look with me in verse 24. No man can serve two masters. 
For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. That's pretty plain. I mean, it's not like, uh, well, there's certain situations where you can, or there's certain... He basically said, you cannot serve both of them. One or the other is going to be the dictator, director, and master of your life. I remember when God had given me a real good job in Houston. And I was telling you before I moved to Corpus Christi, for six months I battled on whether to leave and obey God's voice because of what I had. I had a nice home. I had a very nice car. I had a nice place and a nice job. And I remember I struggled for six months because of the root that these good things had gotten in my heart because I could not let go of them in order to follow God. And it says about Abraham and his children, it says they walked through the land of promise. I mean, they lived in the land of promise in tents. They walked through the land that God said He was going to give them, but they lived in tents because they continued to move because their eyes were fixed and set on a kingdom not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, who's built an architect with God. Now let me tell you something, I'm not stationary right here. If God says tonight in a dream, Andy, I want you to head to, to Dallas or to North Dakota, we were laughing about in some movie we'd seen about North Dakota. But, uh, you know, they lived in tents. Their hearts were not planted and set in this world. And there's nothing wrong with living in the same place 50 years. There's good things about that too. If God's got you there, He's establishing there, and He's doing that. But you move and you do things with God being the director, the one who gives wisdom and insight. He's the one that leads and guides. Look with me back now in verse um, 19. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your heart is in your bank accounts, that's what you're always going to be thinking about. Always going to be worried and concerned about it. What's going to happen if this happens? What's going to happen if that happens? What's going to go on if, if this goes on? That's where your heart is. That's where your fear is. That's what you're worried about. But I'm going to tell you, if your heart is truly in people, that's going to be the thing you think about. Lord, how can I meet these needs? What part do I have to play in what you're doing in this day? What part do I have to play? For where your treasures, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye is single, the whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is thy darkness. And he is speaking about that single eye. Here's the test I went through this, this week. Um, I guess it was a couple weeks ago, I just began to think, you know, um, you know, maybe if I get a a part-time job out here at this one particular place, and they've got some really good benefits that are that are given to part-time workers or whatever, and fly the airlines flying, you know, and things like that. And I was thinking, you know, maybe I'd do that, and I could still work out, maybe two weeks out of the month, go in and doing what God's called me to do. And I was thinking about all these different things, and um, and first of all, you know, my wife began to say to me, you know, began to point some things out about that, and. God was trying to speak to me through her, and I, I just, I was trying to figure out my own thing, my own thinking. And then, uh, then Phineas came and and, and showed me a, a divided heart. Because what what God began to show me is that from December until this day, I've never asked for a penny, and every month God has given us more than enough, and it, it, it's amazing. And yet, in my mindset. I still want to help God out and figure out a way to, to make it all work so that just in case this next month he doesn't come through, I can have something where I can say it's going to be okay. And what he showed me was a divided, adulterous heart that I wasn't trusting him. Now, your place of trusting may be in your job. You know, how are you going to continue on in this place? I don't know, but the place where God was trying to t- show me a divided heart was in this situation. There's a scripture that Bob McLeod reads over and over, has spoken to me over and over again, and 
and it goes through my mind. And it's in Isaiah, and it says, um, Those that trust in the arm of the flesh will not see prosperity when it comes. Are you going to trust in the arm of your flesh? Then you won't see it when it comes. Your eyes will be blinded to it. The idols will, will keep you from seeing it. But I'm going to tell you, when we begin to lay it before the Lord, and say, Lord, I, I'm coming to you. I want you to be the sole master and dictator of what I do, say, and where I go. Your eyes will see it when it comes. Prosperity will be open to you. And when I'm speaking about prosperity, I'm not talking about the things of this world. I'm talking about the things that matter. Peace. Joy. Righteousness. It says the righteous will give and never never lend or will lend without um, gosh I just spoke that without but something like that look with me real quickly in Proverbs 28 I just want to make this one point do y'all mind hanging on with me for a little bit just a little bit further because I, I do have some other scriptures that I want to apply more to the to our heart Proverbs 28 verse 22 he that hasteth to be rich hath what? Remember what we just read in Matthew 6? And considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. He that hasteth to get rich. Listen, I was there. It was, it was a snare that was laid before my life as I was following God. And when I got my foot in it a couple of years ago, It almost took my soul because in my heart, all of a sudden, I began to contemplate and think about, and it is sad, just the imaginations that go through mine, I began to think about the beaches of Tahiti. Here I am. I'll be sitting back getting a suntan with a Coca-Cola and a a cell phone, talking to the people back in the States, telling them what to do. All these imaginations. But I'm going to tell you what. I'm just being honest. And I'm going to tell you what the end result of that would be. And listen, I believed at that time I could make that happen. I really did. And the end result of that had not I heeded the correction of God would be a life of emptiness apart from Him while I clothed myself in religion and all the things that I've done in the past. All the religious works I've done in the past. And, and, and one of the things I clothe this, this greed with, well, if I can get more, I can give more. But the end result of my getting was keeping. It wasn't going. It was buying me nicer things. Look with me. and um, did, Yeah, we just read that. Luke chapter 12. And as we read Luke chapter 12, here's a scripture you can look up later. It's in Numbers chapter 11. It's about the children of Israel. And again, they're not to be the, 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 the standard bearer. That's not who we want to be like. And in Luke, I mean, Numbers chapter 11, it speaks of those who had God's provision for them. And they cried out and complained against God and said, God, would that you would give us meat. They were not, they were not satisfied with what God had given them. And I looked up covetousness in this next verse we're about to read, and it means greedy desire to have more. To have more than you've got. This yearning to want more than what you've already got. And that's where the children of Israel were. There was this greedy desire. They already had God's provision, but they said, I want more. They began to look at the world or the things around them, and and I would like a nicer TV. I'd like a nicer house. I'd like a nicer... I I want more than the provisions God has now given me. And it says those people that day were buried in the place of greedy desire. Numbers chapter 11, around the end of the chapter, it says God wiped out several thousand of them. And they were buried in the graves of greedy desire. That's what that word means, greedy desire, if you look up and look up Numbers chapter 11. Right here in Luke chapter 12, verse 13. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother. And he had just been, you know, teaching them and sharing to him. Now listen, look at me. Can you imagine? Here's Jesus, and he's teaching this things to his disciples. He's talking to them, and he's expressing, he's opening the word up to them. And all of a sudden, you've got this interruption here, and this guy says, 
And one of the company said, and said upon him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And he said unto them, he's speaking to his disciples. Now this guy breaks into his conversation. Now he's talking to his disciples. And he's trying to teach his disciples something. He says, Take heed and beware of covetousness. And again, covetousness, greedy desire to have more. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake this parable unto them. And he begins to talk about a man who, who farmed this land. And, he's, and he began to store up all that he had. He began to store it up. And, and once he got it all stored up, he said in his heart... Um, Look with me in verse 18. And he said, This will I do. I will put down my barns and build greater ones, and there will I bestow all my fruits and goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast many goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. Remember Ezekiel 16. It says they were satisfied, and they became complacent. But God said unto them, that Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be, and which... which Thou hast provided. So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. And you know what? He's speaking this not to the pagan world. Not to the pagans out there that are storing up stuff for themselves. He says to his disciples, You beware of covetousness. You beware of every form of greed. For even when you have an abundance, your life does not consist of the things that you have. And then he begins to share that parable. He's speaking this to disciples because, listen, greed can come into our life. And you don't have to be a millionaire to have greed in your heart. You know, just this week, God was exposing to me a form of greed, and I've got enough to take care of myself. But you know what? Covetousness says, I'm not satisfied. I want to make sure there's more. I want to make sure I have more than what I've got. And guys, the issue is never, and I, I just... I hope this gets settled in your heart like it is in mine. The issue is never money and finances. The issue is a heart, whether it be divided or whether it be single. Whether he be master or other things are master. I'm going to tell you, if he is master, whatever comes into our life, if it's financial or if it's any other way, there's a purpose to it. And if he gives us an abundance, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with an abundance. I've got an abundance compared to a lot of people in India. A lot of people that would think I'm a billionaire, you know. But I don't. But my abundance may not look like much compared to Bill Gates or somebody like that. So, so it's not what they have or what I've got or what this person has or what that person. The issue is your heart. And if God has given you abundance, look with me in First Timothy, chapter six. If God has given you an abundance, then there is instruction to you. You know, the early church, they weren't all in poverty. They weren't all broke and had everything taken. For there were people in the early church that had an abundance. And here was Paul's instruction to them by the Holy Spirit. Look with me in verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after. Now listen to this. He's talking to the church. He's talking to disciples. He's talking to believers, which which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many a sorrow. That was the path. There's been a couple of times in my life that I have been distracted from the path of life and headed down this path to be pierced through. And God in His mercy saved me from it. But I'm going to tell you, he says, listen, the love of these things, a heart bent towards these things, it's a root. Look with me in verse um, 11. But thou, man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Look with me in verse 15, verse 16. Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto him, who no man has seen, speaking of Jesus, nor can see. To him be honor and power and everlasting, and everlasting. Amen. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, you know, that they not think of themselves any better than anybody else, nor trust in the uncertainty of riches, but in the living God, who 
giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Do you have an abundance? He says, be rich in good works. And I believe that that's looking for opportunities. That's looking for God. Lord, you have given me this. What do I do with it? Where do I send it? What do I do with what you have given me? Is that the contemplation with what little you have? I'm going to tell you what little we have extra. We pray, God, show us who to give this to, what to do with it. And if he says to do nothing, then it sits there until he says to do something with it. But I'm going to tell you, that's the consideration of our heart. What is the consideration of your heart with what you have? Are you asking God, what do I do with this? There's needs right here in this body. You know, there's needs. You may know people in other places, missionaries, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, God will put somebody in your mind. It's amazing. You just send them what God tells you, send them. And all of a sudden, you get a letter back. Just out of total. You may not have talked to that person in 15 years, and God told you, I want you to send this to them. It's not just what happened in here, it's everywhere. There are servants of God that are dependent upon the Lord because God's put them in places. And God is providing through for them through many of you. God is providing through people here because of the continual giving, not only of our finances, but our life. Are you a giver? Or are you a taker? Are you always looking for someone to give something to you? Or or why didn't they say hello to me? Or why didn't they... Why don't you give of your life? Why don't you go out of your way to encourage someone else rather than waiting for others to encourage you? Look with me and... um, Gosh, I'm just going to turn back, I guess, to Haggai. Like I said, I got... I just... It's amazing what the Word has to say. I mean, it's from... It's from Genesis to Revelation. And you know, speaking about um, freely you've received, freely give, um, that is that is the heart of um, every shepherd and teacher. Everything you do, if you do it and you're looking for something in return, whether it be provisionally or whether it be um, promotionally or whether it be somebody to pat you on the back, you have your reward. But I'm going to tell you, when you do what you do as unto the Lord, not expecting anybody to see it or take notice of it, God says, I'll take care of you. And I'm pleased. When we do what we do in order to be noticed by men, we have our reward. But when you do what you do because you want to please God, whether anybody notices or not, God says, I look upon you, and I will bring about a reward for your life. I'll take care of you. Book of Haggai, look at me, verse 12. Oh, the, <clears throat> the thing I was going to point out about freely receive, freely give, it says about, in the prophets, it speaks about the shepherds and prophets of their time. It says, there's, I think in Micah 3.5, it says, it says they would say things in order to bite with the teeth, uh, in order for what they could get, the coins and the money. And there's a lot of people who say, all right, I want to, I'm just going to be a minister, and I'm going to go out and start doing this and this. And then the, the, the motive behind their giving or doing or being is they're always looking for what's coming back. I'm going to tell you, God will put you in places where there's nothing coming back in order to see where the root of your heart is. Are you giving freely without any expectancy? And more and more, I pray, God, bring me to that place where it's not even a consideration of what's coming back. You give of your heart and life as God gives you wisdom and direction. And I'm going to tell you, God will take care of the rest. It's a hireling. Another thing that Bob McLeod, he's been a real, he's really ministered to me in this area just by his life and watching him live. But one thing he spoke to me when I was in Florida about to leave a church there um, and God had begun to direct me to leave and all these thoughts would come to my mind and they'd say, if you leave this place, I mean, you have got it made here. 
You know, and that's hit me twice. There was another church I was on staff at. And I mean, they, they literally they gave me a credit card and they said, Daddy, you fill your tank up as often as you need it filled up. People would give me incredible tickets to rocket games. It's amazing. And I remember when God was beginning to tell me to address the idolatry and the pride in this particular place, the thing that kept going through my mind was, listen, Andy, you're a youth pastor. You just go back in the back and you take care of your little youth and you let everybody else go do what they're doing. And I began to rationalize. And the root of it was that I was bought and paid for. I was a hireling. Because I was doing what I was doing in order to receive something, to get something back. And I remember when I was making, and it hit me again in Florida. And I was, oh, if I leave this, and, and it wasn't particularly things there, it was just God was giving me direction to go somewhere. And I thought, what am I going to do? What about benefits and all these different things? And I remember Bob spoke to me and he said, Andy, and, I, and you know, and all the loving kindness that Bob could share in, he, and he said, Andy, whatever you do, if you do it for money, you're a prostitute. And I want to tell you, you know, listen to me, not just preaching and teaching. If you go to work on Tuesday morning, I guess you're off Monday, if you go to work on Tuesday morning for one purpose, and that's to get a paycheck, you're a prostitute. You're prostituting your life. When you go to work Tuesday morning, you go to work because God has put you in that place. And He said, I want you to do your work as unto me. Not to that employer, but unto me. And I will provide for you through Him. Just because He signs the check, doesn't mean He's the provider. God is the one signing that check for your life. And if you're working, if you're spending your life just working from paycheck to paycheck, you're a prostitute, just like I was. I was giving my life giving my efforts for something in return. I'm going to tell you, that really freed me up. And Mr. Thompson can vouch for it. When I came here, we never even talked about money when I went to work with him. I never even knew. It just it wasn't even, once God had freed me, it wasn't even a consideration. And you know what? God provided for my life through that season of working long and, man, and landscaping and stuff through Mr. Thompson for that season. But I'm going to tell you, it was God's provision. And God was looking at the way I was working. And if I would be faithful in the little that I was doing there. But I'm going to tell you, if I would have been grumbling and complaining and not doing my work right and not doing the best I could, God would not trust me with anything more. Because I was not faithful. We're not, we're not going to read that, that particular scripture. But Haggai chapter 12, we're going to finish up. Um, verse no, chapter 1. So here's this prophet. He's come to him and he says, and here was his cry. He said, consider your ways. He said, you've, be- you've become a complacent and comfortable people. And your concern is more for the, for the house that you're building rather than the house that God's building. And this isn't a, a commercial to, 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 to find money to build a big temple. The house that God's building is a spiritual kingdom made up of spiritual stones, living stones being built together. That's the kingdom. That's the house that he's talking about. You're spending your life on material things, on building comfortable places for you to stay. While the house of the Lord lies desolate, while people's lives are broken and destitute. And he brings this word of conviction. And here was the response of the people. Look, the response of the people was... Broken, oh. They recognized the word of the Lord and they said, I agree with this in my heart. I bear witness to this conviction. Chapter, verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai, the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent them, sent him. And the people did fear before the Lord. And the fear of God You know how they feared God? By obedience. When they heard the word of God, they obeyed it. And it doesn't say what all they did, but here's what God did when He saw their heart turn towards Him. Verse 13, Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. 
And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shilti, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, in the fourth and twentieth verse of the day. Who was it that stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel? Who was it that had stirred up the spirit of Joshua? Who was it that had stirred up the spirit of the remnant? The Lord had stirred their hearts to put their hand to the work. That means He began to move in their heart and show them what to do. Joyce was talking about different parts of the body operating different ways. When we begin to put everything before the Lord, this is what it is, God. Here's all that I am. Everything that I am, I lay before you. Do with it as you wish. God will begin to stir your spirit and He will show you what to do. He will give you wisdom. Some of you, it may be, I want to send you out to the streets of Palestine. Some of you, it might be, I want you to go to the widows and I want you to begin to take care of the widows and and, and take care of their lawn or take care of their home or do household things for you. Some of them, it might be, I want you to begin to be a missionary and to begin to to go to different places and come back and bring good report and, and share what God's doing. I don't know what God will have for you and I. Some of it may be prophetic in this place where God raises you up and you have to share hard things that give light to, 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 to expose things within the body or within an individual's lives. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you, it, won't, it will not come until we open up before God and we say, everything that I am or have belongs to you. You do with it as you wish. And when the people turn from their own way, God begin to stir their spirit and show them what to do. And the only way the house of the Lord will be built in this last day is through a supernatural working of the Holy Spirit through His body. I can't tell you what God... You know, it's not my place to say, all right, everybody, we're going to meet here uh, for visitation at 2 o'clock and everybody's a soul winner and everybody's going to go knock on doors and do... You know, that's what we've tried to do in the past. Everybody, we're going to pattern and everybody... Listen... If, if God's moving on your spirit, go knock on doors, go for it. You'll run into some incredible people that God will just open things up. If God's told you to, whatever it is, I promise you, He will give you insight as a, what do they call them, skilled carpenter in the body of Christ for whatever it is He's skilled you to do. And um, I believe that God has brought this word because He wants to bring repentance into my heart and give me a single eye that says, God, what nothing else is the issue but you. And so, Lord, I come to you. And Father, I just pray over this place and over your word. I know that you're doing this work in my heart. And so, Lord, I just um, I thank you. And I ask you to protect me and everyone here from every form of covetousness and greed. And Lord, we can't even see it unless Your Holy Spirit opens it up to us. And Father, I know, Lord, that You are the Creator of the heavens and the earth. You could tell us to go fishing, and and in the fish's mouth could be a, a, a coin to provide for whatever needs necessary. There is nothing too big for You. But Lord, I pray that You would find our hearts faithful. And I just repent right now the division of my own heart, the adultery of my own my own spirit. Lord, that I would say in my heart that I trust You, but I continue in my heart to bend in other directions. And I pray that You would just give me that godly repentance, continue to work it in my heart in such a way that the only consideration of my life is Your Word and Your Holy Spirit that gives direction and life to that Word. Father, I pray for this body. I believe with all my heart that You're wanting to do the work of Haggai here. You're wanting to bring um, light to our life. And You're wanting to stir our spirit for the good work. And Lord, You said further on in this chapter, that in the next chapter, that the latter glory will be greater than the former. The work that You're doing in these last days is an awesome thing. And I just thank you that we can be a part of it. Lord, perfect in us humility and the fear of the Lord. Lord, bring about in every one of our lives that poverty of spirit 
Lord, we're, we're beggaring, or we, we're poverty, we're, we're, we're impoverished before you, and are in desperate need for your direction and fulfilling and provision. And you've promised to do that work. I pray your favor and blessing over our lives, that you would turn us from our own way and turn us towards you. I ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.